Good morning. morning. We're here to, to study God's word. We're a teaching place. That's what we do. We study the word of God because we believe it to be God's inspired word from front to back, all 66 books, all the authors, and that God has left it here as an example as to how we should live. And so when we look at the scriptures, it's much more important what the scriptures have to say than what I have to say or what you have to say. And so we want to look at what Jesus teaches us today in Mark chapter 9. So if you guys would pray with me. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity to be here in a place that's safe, that's quiet, that's heated and air conditioned sometimes at the same time in one day. And Lord, we rejoice in the life that we have and everyone that you have led here for this moment. You know all of our souls. You know the needs of each of our souls. I appreciate the emblem that you have left in communion, that we practice the common union that we have in you. That we remember that you shed your blood, that you sacrificed your body for us. I pray that we might do the same in reciprocation to you now as we offer you our hearts and our minds, that your word would find a suitable place in our lives, in our hearts, that it might bear fruit for you. So, Lord, we offer ourselves to you and pray that you would do that, which is pleasing to you in us. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Well, we've been in the book of Mark. We're in chapter 9. I'm always so disappointed when I can't do 50 verses in one standing, and yet uh, that's just the way it is. So I beat myself up a little bit. You'll have to forgive me. Now let's see if this thing will work today. Oh, it does. God bless America. Thank you, Wendy. Last week, we were in chapter 9. I, I, I thought we'd get to chapter, verse 50, but it never happened. Jesus is coming down from the Mount of Transfiguration, which we did two weeks ago, where Jesus is revealed for who he truly is. And he took with him Peter, James, and John. He was revealed for who he truly was in his glory. And he shone like the sun, brighter than any Clorox could make him. And he was there with two witnesses. And they were talking about his exodus from this world. And in the midst of all that, Peter opens his mouth because he doesn't know when to be quiet. And he says, it's good that we're here. That, that's great, Peter. Maybe you should, you know, like they're having a conversation over there. And he answers a question that was never asked, which, do you ever do that? Yeah, yeah I know. I learned from that <laughs> myself. And so all of that happens. And, you know, Peter proposes to make three booths, one for Elijah, one for Moses, one for Jesus. And, and then uh, the Lord shows up in this cloud, this Shekinah glory, and says, this is my son. Listen to him. And Peter on his face, as he should be, because God had to interrupt Peter, interrupting the meeting. And suddenly Peter looks up and it's all over and it's done. And Jesus says, come on, we've got to go down. Because you can't stand a mountaintop forever, can you? That's the hard thing about vacation is the reintegration. You know, you, if you have a suitcase full of clothes, they all need cleaning and they smell foreign and odd after being in there for a while. And you have to reintegrate back into your life. And there's usually a stack of things that you have to get to. And so the disciples go down and they find utter chaos down on the bottom of the hill. The remaining nine disciples that were down there have been mobbed by people looking for Jesus and only finding his disciples. A man who comes and brings his son and says, listen, I, I brought my son here, except your disciples couldn't heal him. He's got a spirit. He's got this evil spirit that comes upon him and throws him on the ground and he's gnashing his teeth and he's foaming at the mouth and he writhes around on the ground. But I brought him to your disciples, but they could not help me. Boy, I hope that never happens with people coming here. They very well could though, couldn't it? Because we are a, a, a shadow of a substitute for who Jesus really is. Amen. And people don't need us. They need Jesus. Amen. So it, Jesus shows up and he asks him some questions, kind of goes into doctor mode. And he says, well, how long has this been going on? And so he gets some information. And then he begins to see that there's a crowd forming. And he's just amazed at the lack of faith of people. And he's like, how long am I going to be with you guys? This is... 
And how often will I have to do miracle upon miracle before you believe I am who I am? You know, the same question could be asked of us. How often do we go through the same trials and we end up trying to dig into our own resources and failing? And then we think, wow, I never even prayed about this, did I? And then I suddenly understand why it didn't work <laughs> and why it's not over and why I haven't gotten a passing grade in this test because I didn't ask the Lord. So he says, bring him to me. And he finally brings him to Jesus. And Jesus sees the crowd forming. And he says, I got I to gotta move quick. And he casts the demon out. And he tells him, don't come back again. I like that. Get out of him and don't come back. And I love that little don't come back. That's, uh, that's something we should pray for. That something doesn't come back. And so Jesus casts him out. And we, we see a wonderful end of the story later on. The disciples ask him, what in the world was that about? And how come we couldn't do that? Well, they thought he was dead at first when it happened. He fell to the ground and he didn't move and it looked like he wasn't breathing to the point where some people said, he's dead. But Jesus reaches down, and I love this about Jesus. Jesus is always touching people. Amen. He reaches down and he grabs the boy by the hand and he lifts him up. And he's completely fine. And that's the end of that. So later on, they get into the house in Capernaum, presumably Peter's house where he lived, kind of the center of where they would run their little missionary journeys from. And the disciples want to know why. Why were we not able to cast it out? Because previously they were. And Jesus gave them power to speak to <laughs> demons and cast them out. And he says, well, why is it that we couldn't do it? And Jesus then asked, answered them and said, listen, it's because this one only goes out by prayer and fasting. So we talked a little bit about prayer and fasting. And prayer is connecting me more to heaven. And fasting is releasing some of the connection that the world has on me. And so by sacrificing that time and those resources and spending it with the Lord, there's something to be gained in the self-sacrifice. It's, it's not a transactional thing where, look, God, I'm suffering. Answer me already. It's not a manipulative move. It's actually an offering to God, and you take that time, and you offer it to him instead of eating. So we looked at that, and then Jesus again beginning to inform his disciples that he's going to Jerusalem, and he's going to die. He's going to be hung on a cross, but on the third day, he'll be raised again, and the disciples all look at each other and say, what's he talking about? And they just didn't get it. I, I do the same thing. I'll read through the scriptures and I'll, there's a little section that I just kind of go over like a speed bump. You go over way too fast and you don't realize what it's saying until you read it and you go, oh, wow, I never saw that. So sometimes that happens with me too, but they get the deal. And then Jesus comes to Capernaum here in verse 33. And when he was in the house, he, he asked them, what, what was this that you disputed with yourselves on the road as we were walking? But they kept silent, for on the road they had disputed among themselves who would be the greatest. You ever, you ever do that? Get into a competitive thing? Who's the greatest? You are all silent like the grave. Look at you. Who do you, who do you think would win in a fight? My kids would ask me, a lion or a bear? Well, they don't live in the same place, so it's never going to happen. Yeah, but what if? <laughs> we always want to know, right? And we do that with one another. We tend to get competitive with one another, right? Um, God help us if, if you still have that going on, but it does tend to rise itself up, you know? Um, so they're arguing on the road, and I wonder, because Peter, James, and John were up on the mountain with Jesus, and the other disciples are like, hey, what happened up there? I can't tell you. What do you mean you can't tell me? Well, Jesus told me not to say. What? You're going to keep a secret like that from me? Well, Jesus said. And now they have a, it seems like they're using that bit of an experience with Jesus is to elevate themselves against the others. I would assume that goes on. I had two brothers, so I guess I'm projecting a bunch of things that happened with brothers. But they were all somewhat related and traveling together. And so I, I don't think it's too far-fetched to think that that may have been the seeds of what caused this giant competition. 
So Jesus reveals himself up on the mountain, his greatness. And then Jesus, he gives instruction to them and begins to tell them. But in a minute, he's going to give an illustration. I love the way that Jesus teaches. He doesn't just say stuff and say, there it is. He says, I am the light of the world. And he finds a blind man and heals him. He says, you who have ears to hear, hear what I'm saying. He finds a deaf man and heals him. He tells people, come and follow me. And then he finds somebody who's crippled and heals them. You see, all of those things are to prove that Jesus' words aren't just words. They're life. They're reality. And so he's going to give an illustration in just a moment. Now, this is not the last time that Jesus has to address this worldly mindset of the disciples. And he kind of catches them with their hand in the cookie jar. And so they don't want to answer. But here in Matthew 20, there's another time Jesus has to address their competitiveness. And it says, then the mother of the Zebedees, that's James and John, by the way, the sons came to him with her sons. Now, by the way, these are adults. So, you know with her sons, kneeling down and asking something from him. So here comes Mother Zebedee and grabs James and grabs John and they drags him to Jesus and they get on their knees in front of him. This is a performance of a lifetime. There, there's, there's an Emmy in this, I'm sure. And she said to him, grant that these two sons of mine may sit one at your right hand and the other at your left in your kingdom. But Jesus answered and said, you do not know what you ask. Are you able to drink of the cup that I'm about to drink and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? And they, they said to him, we are able, not knowing what it was Jesus was talking about. He's talking about the crucifixion. And so when the 10 heard it, they were greatly displeased with their other two brothers. You got your mom <laughs> to petition Jesus for a position in the kingdom on the right and the left of him? Oh, man, that's, that's really, that's, that's some serious manipulation, right? And I don't know if it was mom's idea, if she's like one of those helicoptering moms who's just like over-controlling, or whether it was James and John who said, ah, don't listen to her. Let's bring her. And let's, let's figure out the script. Let's all go. And let's kneel down. Okay, and then we'll let her speak. And we won't say anything, right? And then, like, did they plan this whole thing? They're going to go up and they're going to try to muscle Jesus into getting a position in the kingdom. Jesus had to address this once before, but not just with James and John. <coughs> so that's like strike two. Strike three comes here in the book of Luke. And this was during the time just before Jesus goes to be crucified. He says, now there was also a dispute among them as to which of them should be considered the greatest. And he said to them, the kings of the Gentiles exercise lordship over them. And those who exercise authority over them are called benefactors because they get some kind of benefit from them. But not so among you. On the contrary, he who is greatest among you, let him be the, as the younger. And he who governs as he who serves. For who is greater, he who sits at the table or he who serves? Is it not he who sits at the table? Yet I am among you as one who serves. Jesus always trying to tell them it's not about trying to achieve greatness, to be thought of as a top dog, as, ah. Uh, Carl is mean sometimes. <laughs> Carl tells me, oh, listen to the story. Carl. He says, you know what we're going to do, Pastor Dave? We're going to get you a parking spot right in the front. And so nobody else will park there, but you'll get a big sign. Pastor's parking. <laughs> oh, no, you're not. I tell him, no, you're not. I'm going to park far away. I don't want anybody to know where I'm parking. Well, that must be the, the pastor's car. Because my Mercedes is a real... No, it's not. <laughs> He's always trying to put me in a place where I'm going to, you know, be elevated. And I keep telling him, you know, forget about that. Let's work on something else. And Jesus is telling these guys the same thing. Don't, don't go trying to be over people. And that, that's what it really is. It's to be in charge, making the decisions, pulling the strings, getting your way. 
that whole aspect of leadership, Jesus said, you got to cut that out. you got to erase it from your mind. But this is the third time Jesus is having to speak to his disciples and tell them about this competitive nature. I wonder, how many of you, I won't ask for hands because you won't raise them anyway, how many of you have a competitive problem? Like, hey, I'm, yeah, I'm, by the way, I'm on a diet. Oh, yeah, how much you lose? Well, six pounds. I lost nine. <laughs> right? I mean, you feel that? It's like a, like a whole swagger thing. And Jesus is trying to correct them. Don't think like this world. These people who are benefactors, these people who are in positions of authority, they rule over. I mean, with an iron fist, they enjoy that aspect of leadership. But you should be like you're the youngest in the family, which means you have no say in anything. They just drag you around from place to place, and that's just the way it is. You know, older brothers and older sisters, they get to do whatever, and, you know, you got to go to bed when mom and dad say so, and they get to stay up later. So Jesus says you need to be as the younger, which is, okay, okay, I'll go here, I'll go there, I'll do whatever. And you also need to be like the least, like the one who serves. And he goes, for example, we're all sitting around a table. Who's the greatest at the table? Jesus knows he's the greatest at the table. He doesn't need to tell anybody that. Amen. And he goes, but here, I'm as one who serves, because you know what he does? He goes around and washes all their feet. Because nobody wanted to do that job. Feet of old fishermen who wear open toe sandals on dirt roads. And it's funny, Jesus gave them a long time to rectify this issue, and it didn't happen until after dinner. And Jesus said, well, nobody else is going to do this. This is a teaching moment for me. And he moves in, and he washes their feet. So you know, the, you know the situation there. So Jesus is addressing this mentality of competition. Uh, who's the greatest? I can tell you, when we get to heaven, there'll be people at the front of that table who you don't even know. There'll be people who have been quietly serving in the background, devoted to the Lord 100%, doing things out of purity. I'm sure Wendy will be there. Now I ruined it. It won't be a surprise for you. we got to get over this greatness thing. We all contribute. God has gifted each one of us and given us a degree of faith, as God has given. And we're faithful to deal with what he's given to us. And if he's given you a lot, he's expecting a lot back. If he's only giving you a little, don't worry about it. it. He grades on a curve. He does. I mean, if you, if, you have a simple, if you have a simple gift, if you have a simple offering, then by all means, do that. Maybe you can't sing. Maybe you can't lead worship. Maybe you can't teach, but I'll tell you what, I saw people show love at that front door, handing out bulletins and getting to know people and showing love to people, which makes a bigger impact than you have any idea to shine the love of Jesus on people, to meet a stranger. That's a big deal. So Jesus having this problem with their authority is, and he sat down and he called the 12 and he said to them, if anyone desires to be first, he shall be last of all and servant of all. So here are nine expressions of greatness that Jesus is going to go over. He's going to tell you, now this isn't your best life now. This isn't anything that you'll find on the shelves. This is from the Bible. And this is taught by Jesus. You want to be great, do these nine things. Make sense? You with me? Yes. All right, because I'm getting very teachy right now. Number one, you need to be last in order if you want to be first. So when everything's over here and it's time to eat, you know, when everyone runs for the door, like, out of my way. And, you know, they're barging through and where are the plates? And they grab the plate and they're the first one in line. And you would never do that. By the way, there are people who get there before you because they sneak out like they're going to the bathroom and they go out there. And <laughs> you see them sitting down when you go in there. And you're like, you dirty dog. I was going to get that. I, ho I hope they have some left. By the way, there's a giant thing of soup today. So, you know, in case you're interested. At least that's what I think it is. You want to be the greatest? You be the last person in line. Why? Because Jesus said so. Because that's what Jesus did. He put himself last. He should have been first. 
He's the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Right. He should be first in our life. But you know what? He takes second place sometimes. He takes third place. Sometimes he's all the way on the bottom. And he hasn't thrown a lightning bolt through your skull yet. <laughs> Amen? Amen? Sorry if you've been struck by lightning. I don't mean to offend you. So Jesus said if you're last in order, you will be first as far as God's concerned. You'll be number one in his book. And you know what? That's more important to me. Number two expression of greatness is serving. The lowest in rank to serve. Did you know that when you went to somebody's house, they typically would have the lowest servant at the front door. They would make you sit down. They'd take your shoes off, put it into place, wash your feet, and then you'd be able to go into the house, and you'd go in barefoot so you don't drag all that smelly, stinky stuff into the house, and you got nice, clean feet. It was the lowest job of the lowest servant in the house. It's like, oh, i got to take the garbage out. You know, it was the lowest job. Not, I mean, garbage out is nothing. Washing stinky, smelly feet of some men, that's, you got to have some humility right there. So they do that. Jesus said, you need to be the servant of all. And he does this at the Last Supper. And he leads by example. In John chapter 13, we see him washing the feet of the disciples as he goes. And so this isn't something where Jesus just says, guys, you should do this. It's a good idea. But he doesn't do it. He does it. He demonstrates it. Not only does he teach something, but he shows something. I don't know about you, but I like show and tell. How about you? A little show and tell. I remember when I was a kid and you could bring in like your favorite thing and you go, this is my favorite thing. Teachers say, okay, thank you. Next, you know. Show and tell was always good because you could share what it is that's part of your life with everybody else. And Jesus doesn't just tell us what to do. He shows us what to do. And when he stretched out his arms on the cross and he died and he says, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. He shows us how we should live. And he could have called down 10,000 angels and just wiped everybody out. But he didn't do it. He hung on a cross and he bled and he died in our place. So that if we have faith in him and if we give him our lives, his life counts for ours. And our account is clean with God. And that's the gospel, people. That's the bottom line. Jesus came to serve. He was the sacrificial lamb of God the one who takes away the sins of the world. And I am so glad I met him. Amen. Without which I'd have absolutely nothing to say up here. So Jesus leads by example about being the lowest in rank and serving. And then he took a little child, not like you find on Amber Alerts, by the way. Jesus <laughs> took a little child and set him in, set him in the midst of them. And there's actually some uh, backstory on what child this was. but And when he had taken him in his arms, there is Jesus touching people again. He said to them, whoever receives one of these little children in my name receives me. And whoever receives me receives not me, but him who sent me. So Jesus said, if you receive a little child. Now, back then, Little children were not thought well of. They were to be seen and not heard. Even in my generation, children would be seen and not heard. Maybe not even seen. Maybe completely ignored. You know. Today, it's a convenience or an inconvenience if you're pregnant and people get rid of children conveniently, legally, not ethically. And children aren't thought very well of, and they're on the bottom of the totem pole. And Jesus said, you need to find the least. You need to find the less. And I think that's a good example for us. So he illuminates by giving an illustration. Illumination by illustration. He loves children and he has no problem touching people, hugging people, wrapping his arms around people. So all you non-huggy people, there's hope for you. There's hope for you. I was going to say get over it, but that's cruel. I don't want to be cruel, any crueler than I am. Number three, if you want to be great, you look out for the least. You know, normally when people come in here on a Sunday, they look for their friends. Oh, my friend. Oh, oh, so-and-so's here. Oh, oh. And they run to all their favorite people, all their friends. You find that to be the truth? 
You walk in the door, you're, like, you're looking for something. And then maybe there's some people you, you don't want to see. <laughs> oh, here comes Pastor Dave. He's going to try to hug me again. I know. It was <laughs> yeah, so there might be some people that, but Jesus looked out for the least. He's like, who can I minister to? Who can I give to? I look in this room and I try to find people that are sad, crying, lonely, alone. I look for those people and I target you. Did you know that? My favorite target's right here. Because it's convenient. It's on my way up here. And I love that. And sometimes I can't even get to you because there's people all around you, but you're just all alone. Because I think that's what Jesus would have us do. Look for the least. Look for the one ignored, like a child. Look for the one that you can minister to instead of the one that you enjoy talking over the, the football game, basketball game, hockey game, whatever is going on. Looking to the most needy, the lost, the weak, the troubled, the directionless, and the questioning. I believe that's what Jesus is teaching here. Look for those people and discerning by the Spirit of God what their need is and meet it. If you come in here with arms full of blessings, like it's Christmas, and you come in here looking to bless other people and give it away, that's what I think Jesus is talking about. You find those people. Imagine if we all did that. It'd be sickening in here. It'd be so sickeningly sweet with the love of God. People would be bursting into tears, falling on our knees and say, God is among you. And I did not know it. Because it's the love of Jesus that he gives to us that we can give away. And we've been given so much. So look out for the least. Jesus continuing on with being the greatest. Verse 38. And John answered him saying, teacher, we, someone, we saw someone who does not follow us. Casting out demons in your name. And we forbade him because he does not follow us. But Jesus said, do not forbid him. For no one who works a miracle in my name can soon afterwards speak evil of me. For he who is not against us is on our side. Amen. Speaking of casting out demons... We were all hanging out with this kid. We couldn't do anything. Do you think maybe they're a little jealous? These guys are casting out demons, but they don't follow us. You see, they didn't say, and they don't follow you. They don't follow us. Well, why would we follow you? You can't even cast a demon out when you're all by yourself without Jesus. Number four, if you want to be great, don't be a sectarianist. Be inclusive and not exclusive. You know, the mentality of we four and no more, it's like, oh, look, a stranger is coming to church. <laughs> Do you know who they are? Did you invite them? No, I didn't. Did you? How did, how did, how did they come to find us here? I, I, I don't know. <laughs> we should hide. Run away. <laughs> Hi, hi, how are you? I, I, listen, I've been to churches like that. See, I go undercover. I don't tell people I'm a pastor until it's absolutely necessary. And then everything changes. Yeah. People are like, hi, how are you? What, what brings you here to our church? What are you doing? Oh, you're a pastor. You probably never get that. You know, people put the frosted flake on. They act like flakes. Anyway. Be inclusive, not exclusive, because nobody wants to have to force their way into a private club. The body of Christ is not a private club. And if it was, you would not be a member. Good thing our only entrance exam is, are you a sinner? Do you need salvation? Do you need to be forgiven? And do you need to be completely clean from the inside out? That's it. Those are the requirements. I'm glad that I fit that bill. 
Be inclusive and not exclusive. If you want to be a servant, if you want to be great, if you want to be everything that Jesus wants you to be, you do that and you are inclusive instead of exclusive. Now, there are some people you shouldn't include yourself with. Those who worship demons, there are people with very false doctrine, there are people that do, and you know, some of us are like God's bouncers. Boy, it got really quiet in there. I think these guys were jealous of what these other people were doing because they themselves couldn't do it. And instead of rejoin and joining them and saying, praise God, you're casting out demons. That's awesome. You're binding darkness. That's awesome. You're freeing people from demons. Awesome. That should be the end of the story. Not, well, you don't follow us. It's not even about you. It's about Jesus. You find people that follow Jesus, you should rejoice about that. Amen. Include them. Because you're going to see them in heaven, you'll have to live with them forever. So deal with that. And it's not about following you. There's this whole mentality of us and them. It's not us and them, it's us. The, 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 the circle of us is much bigger than you might think it is. And you know, those people over there, they don't do things exactly right. And well, it doesn't make them wolves. Make some sheep that limp or sheep that are dirty or sheep that are wayward or sheep that are, but the sheep, mm -hmm. if Jesus is the main ingredient, they better have accepted Jesus as their savior or they don't follow him, but it has nothing to do with following us. What church do you go to? Oh, well, I go to Grace. It's the only perfect place. <laughs> no, it's the only perfect place for you. Because you are a certain piece of puzzle that fits into a certain puzzle. And this is the puzzle you belong to. Amen. It doesn't mean there aren't other puzzles and people who follow Jesus. So if you want to be great, be inclusive, not exclusive. In Luke 9.51, we get to see this spirit that rises up too. It says, now it came to pass and the time had come for him to be received up that he steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem. Speaking of Jesus. And he sent messengers before him, and they went and they entered a village of the Samaritans, now those are the outsider people, to prepare for him. But they did not receive him because his face was set for a journey to Jerusalem. It's interesting. They didn't receive him because it's not necessarily where Jesus was supposed to be. And when the disciples, James and John, saw this, they said, Lord, do you want us to command fire to come down from heaven and consume them just as Elijah did? Let me at him. Let me at him. <laughs> but he turned and rebuked them and said, you do not know what manner of spirit you are of. There's a smackdown. For the son of man did not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. And they went to another village. If you try and you don't get an answer, somebody reviles you and rejects you, pray a blessing on them and move on. Next thing. You don't have to go chasing around people that want nothing to do with Jesus. Just move on. It's okay. The Lord's got other things for you to do. Don't waste your energy because only the Lord can change a human being's heart. Amen? Amen? I'm not saying don't try and try and try. And you do it in love. But if they don't listen, don't call down fire from heaven and think God's going to consume them because you want him to. You've got an overly developed sense of justice. Let the Lord handle that. Verse 41, for whatever, whoever gives you a cup of water to drink in my name because you belong to Christ, assuredly I say to you, he will by no means lose his reward. But whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to stumble, it would be better for him to have a millstone hung around his neck than he were thrown in the sea. Now, Jesus is saying this on the tail end of them saying, we saw some people casting out demons because they don't follow us. We told them to shut it down. If you stumble one of these little ones of mine, it'll be better for you to have a millstone tied around your neck and drown in the sea. <gasps> Maybe I did this. Maybe I deserve a millstone. That's all in the context, by the way. Which <laughs> Number five, if you want to be great, you serve small. You know, I, I know there are all sorts of books that say you should dream big. Dream a big dream. Trust God for big things. And I'm not saying don't do that. 
But Jesus said, even the smallest thing, like giving somebody a cup of water, will not go without a reward. So what does that say to me? Jesus appreciates the little things. And it's funny, all of those little things mean something. They all make an impact. If you're doing it for the right reason and the Lord is with it, God will use just giving somebody a glass of water. What a blessing that is. Finding somebody who's downtrodden, somebody who's depressed, somebody who's in a bind, and you say, hey, what's going on? What's, what's wrong? And they say, oh, well, I got this thing on my heart. And you say, you know what? I'm going to pray for you. That just seems like such a small thing. But you have no idea what God's going to do with that. You know what I'm talking about, don't you? Small things. Think small. Whoever gives one of these little ones even a cup of cold water because he is my disciple, truly I say to you, he will by no means lose his reward. That's in Matthew. That's the parallel passage. Notice he talks about one of these little ones. He's still got the boy in his arms and saying, if you give a, a glass of water to one of these little ones of mine, you'll be blessed. And I, God sees it. He sees all the little things. Don't think that, oh, I can't do anything big. So what? Do something small. Do a bunch of small things. There's a huge benefit to that. You know, somebody cleaned those bathrooms yesterday. You might think that's a small thing until you have to go in there and sit down. Somebody mopped the fellowship hall yesterday. It smells lovely. You might think that's a small thing, but it's one more thing I didn't have to do. Number six, if you want to be great, be sensitive to not stumble people. Be sensitive to not stumble people. If you want to be great, you don't just go living your life out there and say, I don't care what anybody thinks. And you, what church you go to? Oh, that one. Huh. Let me tell you three things you need to, do, to know that you're doing wrong. They'll say, what an arrogant person you are. What church do you go to? Don't tell them. Don't tell them you come here. You're sensitive to not stumble people. I, I, don't, I don't wear revealing clothing because ain't nobody wants to look at that. But I don't want to mess anybody up, right? And summer's coming. I better not see Rocco in a miniskirt. That will just make me crazy. You want to be sensitive not to stumble people. You want to be sensitive that your actions affect the people around you. You want to know that you have an impact on, on the people that surround you. And they may give much more weight to your actions and words than you even know. If you want to be great, you're going to be sensitive not to stumble. And Jesus said, if you stumble one of these little ones, it's better for you to have a millstone tied around your neck and drown in the ocean, which I don't know about you, but that's like the makings of a bad nightmare, right? Drowning. That's one of the ways I'd rather not go. Burning is another one. Falling from a great height. I have a whole list. Verse 43. Jesus still continuing about what greatness is. And if you want to be great, what you do. He says, if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter into life maimed rather than having two hands go to hell. In the fire that shall never be quenched. Where the worm does not die. And the fire is not quenched. And if your foot causes you to sin, cut it off. It's better for you to enter into life maim, lame rather than having two feet and be cast into hell, into the fire that shall never be quenched, where the worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. And if your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye rather than having two eyes and be cast into hellfire where the worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. <laughs> and people say, There's, the Bible doesn't talk about hell at all. <laughs> Here's three in just one slide. Jesus says, if your hand causes you to sin, 
Do you think he's talking about a literal hand? No, no because you got another one on this side, right? So if I cut this one off, I still have this one available. If that one's gone, I'll figure out how to do something wrong with my feet. If that happens, I'll cut them off, and then my eye, I'll pluck that out, and then the other one, and if it's my ear, if it's something I'm listening to I shouldn't listen to, i got to hack those off. I mean, how are you going to get around? <laughs> the problem is in the human heart. So Jesus isn't talking about physically doing this. Actually, uh, Deuteronomy 18 explicitly says not to amputate certain parts of your body. But anyway, um, so it's completely against the Old Testament. And if you, if you have had an amputation, you can't go into the temple before the presence of God because you're not as you should be. Anyway, I digress. If there's something in your life that's causing you to stumble, sin, get rid of it. Cut it off. If it's your computer, unplug it. Get rid of it. You can't do that with your wife. You can't do that with your husband. You can't do that with me. But there are things that cause us to stumble. There, are th I, I had so many records, and they were worth thousands of dollars. I snapped them all and got rid of them. When I realized this principle, there are things in my life that will bring back memories of parties and people and things that I did that I shouldn't be involved in. I can't be around that stuff because that's what it does for me. You guys do whatever you want. But for me, it was music. Music had a huge hold on me. I knew how to play all sorts of things. And, but when I would go back there, the words and just the, the music would bring me back to those places. Times when I was doing things I shouldn't have been doing. And I had to get rid of those things. And I'm so glad that I did. I wouldn't listen to any secular music for years. Nothing on the radio. I wouldn't even listen to classical music. That's secular stuff. I wouldn't listen to jazz music. I wouldn't listen to anything unless it was Christian music. Unless it was directed towards God. And it was given praise and honor to him. Amen. I've modified somewhat. I listen to jazz. And I, and I do listen to classical music. But there are things that I just won't listen to because they have too much of a stranglehold on my heart. I need to gouge it out of my life. I need to cut it off of my life. And even if it's something so dear as an appendage, Jesus is using a metaphor here. Now, not everybody saw it as that. If you want to be great, what you do is you do a radical removal. If you want to be great, Jesus is still talking about what it is to be great. You are about radical reformation. There are things in your life that you're constantly pruning off. The Lord tells us that he will do that for us if we submit those things to him. And he will prune those branches so that we can bear more fruit. And that's the opportunity, right? A radical removal. Origen, who was one of the early church fathers in the first century, uh, Adamantius was his name, his last name. He's uh, known as Origen of Alexandria. Uh, by the time he was 18 years old, he was actually a uh, teacher of a college. He was actually the head of that college. Um, studied uh, Plato, and he's one of the Platonics. Anyway, good dude. He read this passage, and because he had a problem, he emasculated himself. Emasculation is when a man <laughs> is castrated. Oh, okay. Well, it sounded like you had a question. <laughs> He's known for his piety. That guy definitely is, and he has some interesting things to say. Not all of it's perfect. No human being is. But he went to the nth degree, and he actually physically removed part of his body because it was a problem. I don't think Jesus was talking about physically doing that. He was talking about radically changing your life and cutting things off that cause you to be tempted. There are things that you might look at cause you to be tempted. There are things that you might do, places you might go, people you might spend time with, things you might eat or drink. Cut it off. If it's going to tempt you and it's going to push you in a direction where you're going away from God, cut it off. If it's your job, find another one. There's lots of jobs out there. I've had to do that. Anyway, 
Don't go cutting pieces off. I don't want to hear that you're amputee later. Verse 49, for everyone will be seasoned with fire and every sacrifice will be seasoned with salt. Now, salt is good, but if the salt loses its flavor, how will you season it? Have salt in yourselves and have peace with one another. This is one of the more hotly debated passages in the scripture. So I'm going to try to make it real simple because I'm a simple kind of guy. <laughs> Number seven, if you want to be great, be seasoned. What's that mean? That means that you're having things added to you like a steak. If you have a steak, I know you're getting hungry now. If you have a steak and you season that steak, it makes that steak taste better, doesn't it? Oh, yeah. I'm feeling a steak right now. <laughs> Jesus said, for everyone will be seasoned with fire. I don't know about you, but the difference between a burger done in a frying pan and a burger on an open flame. Wow. Okay, now you're getting it. <laughs> in Leviticus in chapter one, it talks about a whole burnt offering. And the whole burnt offering actually is a burnt offering with salt on it. Strangely enough, so it has an Old Testament root, and Jesus is talking about being sacrificed. Everyone will be seasoned with fire. As a believer, you know, we as believers are constantly being tried from the outside, and we will be seasoned. And as to whether we're going to start cutting things off and getting rid of them or not, like he said in the previous passage, is going to be a challenge. But every one of those sacrifices that we make will be seasoned with salt. In other words, God's blessing will be upon it understand how that works in the context? And every sacrifice will be seasoned with salt. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3 verses 12 to 15, Paul writing to the Corinthian church says this, now if anyone builds on this foundation, he's talking about the foundation of Jesus Christ, with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, or straw, each one's work will become clear. For the day will declare it, because it will be revealed by fire. And the fire will test each one's work of what sort it is. If anyone's work which he has built on it endures, he will receive a reward. And if anyone's work is burned, he will suffer loss. But he himself will be saved yet as through fire. You see, we as believers are going to be tested with fire as well as to whether the things that we've done in this life are going to be praise and honor to Jesus Christ for eternity or it's just a bunch of junk. It's kind of the biblical equivalent to the three little pigs. You know the three little pigs. One built his house out of straw. One built, you know, you know the story, right? Yes. Good. I, I, I hate to wake you up. But here, three little pigs, two of them built insufficiently. One of them was safe, and he didn't get eaten by the wolf. Strive to put things into your life that are going to build a house that brings honor and glory to God forever instead of wasting your life, and it's just going to get burned up. Television watching. Well, that's probably way, you know, hay, wooden stubble. Um, hours on the Internet. You guys don't have phones, I guess. There are lots of things that are just waste. Lots of things that we talk about that are just waste. Lots of things that we do that aren't designed to bring praise and honor to God. It's more designed for our comfort and pleasure. We can invest our lives instead of squandering our lives. So I want to be like that last pig that builds a house on the rock. And so every sacrifice will be seasoned with fire. It will be tested and it will have salt in it. So if you want to be great, you make sure you're a seasoned person, which means you add to your life things. Number nine, you're going to be sacrificial. Jesus says here that you have peace with yourselves. You have salt in yourselves. He's talking about being a sacrifice, being a living sacrifice, as it says in Romans chapter 12. He says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service of worship. And do not be conformed any longer to the pattern of this world, 
but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is the good, pleasing, and perfect will of God. So we're told to be living sacrifices. You know, if, if I had to make a one-time sacrifice, that's pretty easy. But to be a living sacrifice means you're constantly sacrificing. You're constantly giving up. And of course, the temptation is to roll off the altar, right? And say, I've had enough of this. And yet, we're called to be a living sacrifice because Jesus gave himself for us. And so, if you want to be great, sacrifice is on the menu all the time. It's about you sacrificing what you want over what God would have you do. And sometimes over what other people want you to do. So here's the nine things from this passage which talks about being great. Number one, you're going to be last in order, not first. You don't always have to be the top of the food chain. You don't have to have your hand on everything. You don't have to be involved in everything. Be last in order. Number two, be lowest in rank so that you can serve other people, like washing feet, like Jesus did. Number three, you look out for the least, like a little child. You do what you can for those who have need without direction, without support, without help. That's where our hearts should be. Not just some of us, but all of us. Number four, be inclusive, not exclusive. Here's a way. I meet people and I say, hey, are you a spiritual person? Well, yeah. Well, do you go to church? No. Oh, okay. Well, can I suggest one? Can you be inclusive? Yeah. Well, what if they show up? If they show up, they'll get to see the love of Jesus Christ in every face, I hope. Be inclusive, not exclusive. Number five, if you're going to be great, you serve the small. In small ways, in little ways, even a cup of water to somebody. If you're going to be great, number six, is you're going to be sensitive to not stumble other people. You're going to be aware that your actions have reactions in other people's lives, and you're going to be careful about the way that you live, what you say, where you go. Number seven, there's going to be a radical removal. There's a process where you're always being sanctified. You're always letting go of things. You're always loosing things that are not going to be beneficial for you or the kingdom of God, and you're always doing radical removals. Your hand causes you to sin, get rid of it. Your foot, get rid of it. Because it's better to enter into heaven with one hand than it is into hell with both your hands where the fire does not die, which tells me it's eternal. And the worm doesn't, the worm doesn't die and the fire is not extinguished. That tells me there's an eternal place of suffering. It's not just temporary. Number eight, you're going to be seasoned with salt. As a sacrifice, you're going to be seasoned with salt. So what it is that we give to God is going to be tempered with all sorts of things that we learn from the scriptures and not tainted with our flesh, but seasoned with salt. And number nine, you're going to be sacrificial with others. You're going to be giving of your time, of your talents, of your treasures. You're going to be giving. This is the road to greatness that Jesus lays out for us. It's not what you might read, you know, at the bookstore. But it's something that we should live. And Jesus was the perfect example of this, who came from heaven and didn't think equality with God was something to be held on to, but he emptied himself and he came down being found in the form of a man and he emptied himself unto death, even on the cross. And he did that for us. And it says that we are to have this mind in us, like Christ Jesus. He didn't hold on to those things. He may have had a right to it, but he didn't. Paul the Apostle does the same thing. He had a right to a bunch of things, like getting a paycheck and not having to work and maybe getting married, and he let all that go because I'm better serving the Lord without those things. And they were privileges he could have had. Our willingness to lay down those things for other people is going to show whether we're on the track of greatness or selfishness. Amen.